Dr. Thanos Gentimus is Assistant Professor of Experimental Statistics at LSU. His fields of expertise include data analytics with a special interest in machine learning and neural networks. He created the first digital agriculture class at LSU. Thank you, Dr. Date. Glad to be you here. You know, I love to hang out with statisticians. You have all the answers. Really? <laughs> yes, they tell me. So we're going to tee off. Tell us about your journey to Baton Rouge in LSU. First of all, I am from Greece. That's where I got my bachelor's and master's in uh, mathematics with a specialty in math education. So we have oh, something in common. Nice. Um, and then I got lucky and got a uh, scholarship for UF. That's where I finished my PhD in theoretical mathematics. And then me and my wife started chasing each other, trying to solve the two-body problem. And then finally, in 2017, I got hired here. I was a spy school hire, by the way. And here I am. Well, that sounds like a great journey of two great academics finding their way. We're really excited to have you here at LSU. Talk to us about your research focus. Right. So as I said, I started with theoretical mathematics, but pretty soon I discovered that I'm more applied. Um, I got interested in um, artificial intelligence and machine learning specifically uh, when I was in North Carolina, and that has been my field ever since. Now, I started with applications of AI in health informatics, but when I joined LSU, I saw that there was an opening in agriculture. So that's what I've been doing since. Digital ag is basically my field. So help people understand you jump from theoretical mathematics to AI. What got you interested in that? Honestly, when I was at uh, NC State, there was a lab that I was working in, the Lab of Analytical Sciences, LAS, and they were various uh, groups of people working there, and we all knew what everybody else was doing. And, you know, there were, everybody was trying to kind of jump into this new idea of AI, machine learning, and all that. Um, and I was in those meetings, and I saw that, A, it was interesting, and B, it was actually successful. They had good prediction rates. They had, you know, revolutionized the way that we do analysis, right? So I just had to learn about it. And especially since I had the math background, it was relatively easy to understand the math underpinnings. So the transition was simple. It was mathematically interesting and very useful. So there we go. I like the fact that you said it was simple. <laughs> Help us to understand a bit, how, how is AI solving problems in the world around us? You mentioned health analytics and now you're working in agriculture. AI has optimized so many things. First of all, computer vision. That was computer vision before AI and afterwards. And we're talking now like, you know, satellite from satellites to, you know, endoscopy when we're talking about health. Second, all your social networks, your Google engines, all of these are driven by AI. But AI has also optimized manufacturing. Uh, it's going to replace driving, right? All of this has some sort of AI in the background. So, yeah, I believe AI is changing our lives. So you used the word optimize several times. Help us understand how AI might optimize something, but it might present a danger or ethical challenge. Right. So the optimized portion is basically the machine learning techniques can create predictions based on complex patterns that human beings cannot see, right? So they look into the data, they find a pattern that you and I cannot immediately see and say, oh, if you have all these characteristics, then the answer is blue, red, whatever. And their prediction is much better than our prediction in a sense. The problem is with a lot of these techniques, we just don't know how it happens. It seems like a black box. Even though we are the creators of the algorithms, we don't know exactly what's going on in the background. So you may have a lot of you know, ethical problems there. I've seen a lot of research on that area where, for example, minorities are excluded because they're underrepresented in data, okay? So you have these problems that are not really tractable by humans because the machine code has all, is also not so tractable by us. So that can create a lot of issues. That's why I strongly support you know, research in that area, the ethical implications of AI. Did you ever think we'll get a, to a point where the AI actually flags the ethical challenge? I mean, that would be some sophisticated coding. That would be interesting. That would be interesting. I if, just solved the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very interesting, actually, if we could, in a sense, train an AI to check itself. The research is not at, to the point that we can actually understand what we're doing. And I think we need to spend more time on it. But you're right. We could do that, too, hopefully. So help us understand the difference between machine learning and deep learning in AI. 
Okay, so AI is the big umbrella, right? It contains you know, machine learning, obviously, but ideas from robotics, computer vision, things like that. Now, machine learning is, as I said, a subset of that. Um, all the techniques that machine learning has are techniques of AI. Um, but let's say you can think of uh, neural networks, support vector machines, random force, so applications and data. And then deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Let's just say deep because it looks complicated and also deep because it can, in a sense, identify deep patterns, do something like, you know, a deep thought like our brains can do. One is a subset of the other with deep learning being all the way inside and AI being the overarching umbrella. One of the things that you focused on in your research is helping to make farming more efficient. And now you've created a course, digital agriculture course. Can you sh share with us what is the digital agriculture course all about? So the digital ag course is basically an introduction, ideas from machine learning, data analysis, a little bit of a image processing, computer vision and all that. Because you see, in agriculture nowadays, we have the introduction of drones. We have the introduction of smart machines. We have, you know, satellites. Um, and then we have the field of precision ag, which is basically taking all that and creating, you know, uh, variable application rates or, um, you know, farming plants. So all that exists, but it has become very complicated. So now we're reaching the point that the data being accumulated cannot really be processed by humans. So that's where the digital part comes in. We have more and more people using codes to you know, clear the data or make sense of it. And so the agronomist, let's say, of tomorrow will have to know, besides you know, their agronomic stuff, they need to know Python. They might need to know databases. They might need to know image processing and things like that. So a digital ag is a gentle introduction to those. I'm not going deep in all these ideas. I just give them a taste. I do cover practically everything you need to be dangerous, as I say. <laughs> you learn this and then you can, you know, start going deep. So what, what, what are some prerequisites for that? Would you need to know anything before you came in that class? I mean, maybe something about the field. Do you need any technical skills, statistical background? It helps if you have a stats background, maybe like one or two, you know, simple stats classes. It really helps if you have taken coding, but it's not a prerequisite. Um, and on the other end, it helps if you know a little bit about agronomy, perhaps you've taken a GIS class, or perhaps you've done uh, some sort of precision ag class. But in its inception, the class had no prerequisite. It was literally, let's try to get a couple of people interested in this. So when you think about the class, when it's over, what do you want your students to be able to do? I know you said they might be dangerous because they just know a little bit, but is there something that you would imagine that they would be able to do? as a result of having the experience. Right, so first of all, mine is a very introductory class. So what ends up happening is people like it and start taking more classes, especially I've seen a lot of agronomists, you know, taking some computer science classes, some statistics classes. So the first thing is they get over their fear of this is brand new, I don't know how to do it. And I'm intimidated. So they dive into that. The second thing is they know that these techniques exist. So besides their typical agronomic stuff, they have them in the background. And finally, they're, it's easier for them to connect with the experts in the field. So even if you don't become a data analyst, let's say, it's much easier to talk to one. Show that this is not some alien field that nobody can understand and build bridges with subject matter experts on both ends. Help people understand how AI technology and agriculture is, is really important for the state of Louisiana. So in Louisiana, we have some special crops like rice and sugarcane. A lot of the research that happens on agriculture does not directly translate, okay? So we need to have specific tools for Louisiana. We have so many different soil types. We have the Louisiana around the Mississippi and away from the Mississippi, who have north and south. There's so many variations, so many varieties on the, you know, the products that you, that you plant. We have the hurricane season. We have this weather that is crazy, all right? There's so many things that are ready to be optimized. And right now, we are just basically don't have enough data to do so. Or if we do, we don't have that much adoption. Another thing that's happening in Louisiana is the, um, the change in the adoption of techniques like drones and farming, uh, smart farming. If you go back 20 years, 
1% of the farmers had a drone. And now we're at 13%. So that's going to change. So as we move forward, we'll have more and more data. And that data is going to be Louisiana-based. Precision Ag, with the help of Digital Ag, can actually optimize the whole process. And I think, you know, that's the future. Say a little bit more about the future of AI in ag. I mean, where are we really headed with this in your, you know, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot in terms of predicting the future, but you started down a pathway of how these different kinds of ways of learning are merged. Where, where is all this headed? What I see is agriculture turning into this fully automated process where practically everything is handled by, you know, some sort of smart machine. Um, you're not going to inspect your field anymore by walking around. You're going to fly a drone or look at the satellite imagery. You're not going to create a variable rate plan by asking a consultant. You're probably going to feed it into a machine. You probably won't have somebody in the tractor anymore. It's going to be like completely automated. I mean, if we're, you, if we're talking about automa automated cars, imagine like automated farm equipment, which is much easier because there are no obstacles over there. The process after things are harvested, like optimization in the mills for sugarcane. Again, I don't know if this is going to happen in the next 10 years, 20 years, or 40 years, but that's probably what the future is going to be like. Help us understand how you think AI could help Louisiana be a better competitor in the marketplace. Right now in Louisiana, we have some commodities that are very, very important, like lumber and you know rice, sugar. None of them is optimal. Right now, sugarcane is subsidized because, you know, it's a little bit expensive to grow it. But if these techniques actually work and you can cut down on, you know, fertilizer, you can cut down on irrigation, then, you know, basically the production becomes cheaper. The price will stay fixed. So there you go. Now, when I listen to you talk about that, it strikes me that the type of people who will be involved in agriculture in the future might be different in terms of their educational background, their expertise than you'd have had in 1960 or 1990 or 2000. It, help us understand what that person's gonna look like. What is that training gonna look like for that? Right, and this has been actually one of the reasons why this digital ag initiative start here at LSU. We recognize that the consultants, you know, we have extension agents, consultants that work with LSU and work with the farmers. They now had to answer questions like, how do I, you know, make sense of what my drone says? How do I make sense of what my smart machine says? So besides the agronomic practices, you will need to know a little bit more about, you know, uh, databases. And you'll need to know a little bit about, you know, variable rate planning and all that. So you'll need some sort of computer science background. We're going to be introducing classes like digital ag, and more and more people will take whatever they're doing, like math, statistics, agronomy, science, and AI-based classes. I see that, you know, at least knowing a little bit about how to code, how to manage databases. This will be second nature. Just like, you know, 30 years ago, every agronomist needed to know statistics. Ten years from now, every agronomy, agronomist will need to know a little bit about computer science, from databases to image processing to coding. Wow. Well, I guess Mendel was king, so to speak, in statistics, and now it's going to be the digital revolution. Perhaps. That's exciting. Now, earlier you talked about the hurricanes. You know, I experienced my first one last year. <laughs> it was quite something. Um, help us understand how this digital revolution in AI is going to prepare farmers to recover from natural disasters like hurricanes. So there's already uh, some progress in utilizing drones to assess um, the problems after hurricanes. So that already exists. We're thinking about then optimizing that and keeping it as some sort of um, record that you can then use next year to predict yield based on these issues. And that could also be used for claims, insurance claims, and it can also be used for, you know, future prediction on in terms of, you know, where I'm going to put my money on, like when you have a big field, should I put my money on this side or that side? So having that assessed by a drone rather than by a person will optimize basically your yield next year. 
the prediction of the hurricane and its res results can be, in a sense, known prior to the hurricane coming. So that will help the farmer make sense of where they need to, again, put their money. So if you know, for example, that that field is going to be directly in a path or that field gets flooded more easily, perhaps you don't spend all your money there and you diversify your portfolio and things like that. There's definitely uh, some value in first knowing where the hurricane is going to strike and then afterwards completely assessing what the results were. That, that's a motivation to actually even learn. How can AI technology impact agriculture and potentially influence uh, what's happening with climate change? AI has been hailed as the technology that will help us optimize things like water consumption or fertilizer application. If we move to smart machines and all that, we're talking about a reduction in the uh, consumption of fuel, right? So all of these are moving towards like a greener agriculture in terms of like how, do, how the energy is being used, uh, optimizing planting date windows, right? Reduces the amount of extra effort that you need to put in order to grow the same crops, right? And that extra effort translates to less fuel consumption, less water consumption, less nitrogen, less fertilizer overrunning our, um, our Mississippi River and all that. And right now, we are in the early stages of that, but everybody's pointing that direction. We need to do something to reverse the issue, and that might be something that we can do. Industry is hiring like crazy. Uh, if you look at the big players in agriculture, they are acquiring those startups that have to do with applications of AI in agriculture, and they're trying to staff them with people that know both ends, like both the agronomy and the computer science. But also you see people from computer science jumping into agriculture, which was not something that happened the last five years because there's money involved, okay? Um, all the consultants now, the farm consultants, start putting in their portfolio some knowledge of smart machines or computer science stuff or, you know, databases. So now is the time, honestly. If you are an agronomist and you're thinking, what kind of future should I, if you're, let's say, finishing up with your bachelor's, I would strongly advise you add a little bit of, you know, coding into your resume. Maybe, you know, try your hands with Python. Figure it out, you know, besides, you know, how to fly a drone, how to analyze the data from a drone. That will make you very marketable nowadays. Plus, if it doesn't work out with agriculture, you will still have a skill that is on a very high demand right now. That's good to hear since we are an agriculture mechanical right. institution. Uh -huh. So, fun questions. Okay. I understand you like chess. Mm -hmm. How did you get into chess and why do you enjoy it so much? Well, okay, so I got into chess when I was eight years old. My mother took me to a chess club. I think it was probably like a cheap babysitter, but, uh, <laughs> but I loved it. It, was, uh, it spoke to me. Um, and since then, I've been in various clubs. I played competitively for a little bit. When I came to the United States, I couldn't play anymore, but I kept at it. I was in the, you know, UF's chess club. Then I formed the Florida Poly Club. I'm here at the LSU Chess Club. It's also a great way to connect with my kids now. Well, I understand you had some questions for me. So I know that you're very interested in applications of AI in general, all right? I was actually part of the committee that you had set up to explore AI at LSU. So what do you think about it? Where are we going with AI? Why is there this drive? Well, partly in response um, to your question, you really answered it. I mean, it really is underpinning almost everything we do. We can't pick an area, whether it's healthcare, and we're looking at healthcare applications. And if you think about what I've been promoting here, this Pentagon is agriculture. Clearly, you've made the case that AI undergirds agriculture. It's biomedical science. Um, with access to health rec records, Epic is now driving a lot of what happens in the biomedical area. So it's a massive amount of data. Clearly uh, in, in the biomedical side, it's, it's a big deal. Coast is our other area. Um, this is a massive amount of data, both visual and historical. AI clearly is going to be better at giving us insights into the coast. And then we're very much interested in defense. ROTC is one part of it where we want to have people really understand how to use those techniques if they're going to be in military science but also cybersecurity. 
And on the cyber side, there's a lot of data that could be gathered and, and clearly AI could be helpful. You, you, need, you need the edge in that area. And AI is very important for our last part of the Pentagon, energy. Um, energy is foundational to the state. It's the largest industry. We want, as you use in the language, optimize our opportunities there. It is both an engineering challenge. It's an economic challenge. It is a, a challenge around people and communities. And so when we think about the various data sources that are going to be related to the work in energy, AI is going to be very important for us. And so pulling it all together in, in that Pentagon, really undergirding that are the people and really the methodology. And AI is an important methodology to help us understand the world around us. And so I, I, see, I see AI, computational science, um, all of our abilities um, in statistics, your background is perfect for what we're trying to get done, just really pulling together so we can understand better the world around us in, in our A, B, C, D, and E areas. So it's quite exciting for me. Um, and what I would love to see are more people like you at LSU. Um, we need more people with strong computational skills who really want to help students learn and then be able to apply and then help uh, secure and protect the state of Louisiana across those five industries. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I'm excited about the research you're doing and the work you're doing with our students. I want to thank you for coming on the podcast, and I'm glad that you and your family are here adding value to at LSU and Louisiana. Well, again, thank you for having me here. This has been an excellent experience. And indeed, let's keep the communications open, um, and I promise to put the best effort to help with um, promoting, let's say, AI here at LSU. Thank you.